things elsewhere. Um, but this is a pet topic word. I, I, I was educated in Japanese in the 19th century, and my PhD was related to the Japanese uh, labor relations topic. Uh, uh, but I've always had a long standing interest in a lot because my father was a, a lot of gardener, and my grandfather was a gardener, and I always thought, well, when I get old, I want to be a gardener. And so I could wait to get old, and then I couldn't, well, I got impatient, so I got a lot of it uh, 37 years ago. Uh, coming together, those two things, uh, a lot of it's in Japan, and therefore a natural thing to do. Let me say something, oh, the image, first of all, is very difficult one to get hold of. A classic allotment image. Um, this is a Japanese allotment garden. Uh, in the bed of the Fuji River, <coughs> southwest of Tokyo, and that is indeed Mount Fuji in the background. So, yeah, iconic image. Um, a little bit about our common understanding of allotments. In Britain, there are various origins, but the most important um, origin is from the enclosures movement, and therefore rural. If you go back to um, the beginning of the 19th century, the majority of allotments were in British countryside, and indeed the largest single uh, estate of allotments in any county in England was in Wiltshire. Um, in fact, one of my ancestors was the first person to be thrown off an allotment site for bad behaviour. <laughs> <laughs> According to this particular book, I take that as a, a, a fine heritage, quite frankly. Uh, if we think about allotments, we think of uh, probably about two different strands. One of those is about the origins in rural poverty and subsequently urban poverty and the role that allotments are paid for people in poverty. And that role uh, continues uh, of subsistence food production. Uh, this is a fine span of maize, which is not the genetically modified stuff that we can go and buy in the B and Q, this is multiple cobs, this is uh, Zimbabwean corn, says, uh, Southern African corn, being grown in Leeds. Um, and this is a very fine crop of bitter gourds in the background, and there's amaranth, which goes under various names in the foreground. This is grown by a, a Chinese Vietnamese who is supplying crops illegally, bless him, uh, to Vietnamese restaurants in southeast London. It's kind of. <laughs> <laughs> that's fine, you know, this is how you get yourself out of poverty. That's one thing. The other thing is about leisure, particularly with an older demographic these days, uh, interested in allotments, is something to, come, to do to pass the time. Uh, there was an attempt in the 1970s to reconfigure the role of allotments in British society to do away with the A word, um, as Professor Harry Thorpe called it at the time, and to reconstitute allotments on a more European model of leisure gardens. Uh, unpopular with gardens and very expensive, therefore unpopular with local authorities. But we have these dual sorts of themes in the British case. Allotments for food, some of we go and grow food, and by definition, legal definition, that's what allotments are for, but also a pastime, a place where you can enjoy leisure, particularly if not exclusively in ways of life. That's, if you like, a British perspective. Let's have a look at a Japanese perspective. I could have shown you a picture of a typical Japanese farm, which looks like an allotment. Uh, so small scale, so intricate production. Uh, but we have more detailed um, gardens as well. And if you think of a Japanese garden, you're thinking of something like this. Um, gardening is high art. And that high art of gardening is essentially a product of the closure of Japan from just after 1600. Uh, at that time, the Japanese authorities came to realize the threat that they were under from Western expansion, particularly the Portuguese and subsequently the English and so on. They heard by accident what had happened in Latin America to the Aztecs and the Incas. Um, they understood that the Jesuits had some kind of role in Catholicism, had some sort of role in that and they decided they weren't going to have it. Um, there's a film coming out in the new year um, called Silence, if you're interested in history, which is a, um, based on a book by Engel Shusaku, who's author, um, which is about an apostate Japanese uh, kind of all around. Um, 
Portuguese priest who was living in Japan at the time and faced with the fact that his converts were being um, crucified as a means of controlling Christianity. Japan closed itself off, and during that period, to keep people occupied, to keep warlords docile, high arts were developed. And one of those high arts was gardening. They had much greater history than this. They go back you know, almost as long as Japan, but the development of high art in gardening and so much else was a product of that era. That era came to an end in 1868, when American gunboats turned up, and the Japanese realized they couldn't enforce their exclusion anymore, so they had to do something different. And that different was to learn from the West, to learn how to defend themselves against foreign imperial expansion. And the way to do that is to study the West and adopt Western methods in order to defend Japanese culture in all other respects. And one of the things that was in the West that one might choose to copy as a manifestation of Western civilization, believe it or not, was the allotment garden. And as an aspect, a tiny part of Japan's modernization, people said, well, they had allotments in England, they have allotments in Germany, we must have allotments. So the first Japanese allotments were established in the 1920s and early 1930s, um, in a period when the Japanese consumer society started to take off. That was then truncated in the 1930s after the invasion of China and the uh, beginning of the Japanese 15 years war. But we see these early manifestations of English style allotments in Guild as a fashionable statement of modernity, of Westernness. Well, that was brought to an end by what is for us the Second World War. And we all know that allotments won the Second World War. They all dug for victory. Uh, the Americans had victory gardens, and they dug for victory and won. And the Japanese had allotment gardens and lost. Um, which doesn't say much for the efficacy of allotments as an instrument of warfare. Um, and they lost um, big time. By the end of um, the Second World War, not only the Japanese did, this is Tokyo, in, um, after the March 19th uh, uh, fire bombing, which killed about 140,000 people. Largest single loss of life in any aerial campaign, any single aerial attack. Not much survived that. By that time, people were eking out and living however they could. They were eating tree roots by this point. With the loss of the lockers, you don't get this glorious sense of, hey, we had a moral duty to grow our own food and we did it. That disappeared. Instead, allotments were associated with defeat, with war-related poverty, with dreadful times. So their popularity plummeted, just as people were fleeing from the city to try and food, find food out in King Farms, ironically. In 1949, the legal basis for allotments was abolished. And in 1952, under American pressure, the law relating to food growing land was changed. One of the drivers of Japanese imperialism in the 1930s was chronic underemployment in the countryside. And they realized if you could take farmers who were deeply indebted to landlords and send them over to China, send them over to other imperial territories, not only would that increase the inflow of food into Japan and into the military, but also take off the pressure of underemployment in rural Japan. The Americans therefore identified absentee landlords as a major cause of rural unrest and Japanese fascism. So they transformed the landscape into a landscape of tiny owner-occupied farms to give all farmers a stake in the post-war Japanese uh, capitalist-based system. In order to do that, the government, the government under American pressure abolished the right of anyone to rent agricultural land in order to protect this owner-occupied system. But in doing that, in abolishing tenure, in uh, abolishing the, the leasing of land, the renting of land, 
That also made it legally impossible for people to rent land to grow their own vegetables on allotments. They were now classified as people who were at risk of being exploited by their landlords. So protect, to protect them, they weren't allowed to rent land for allotments. A perverse outcome of what was otherwise fairly high-minded and, and rational change. After um, the Korean War, the Japanese economy uh, expanded very rapidly under American influence. <coughs> we see a resumption of mass urbanization and the development in Tokyo, one of the biggest cities in the world. That created very little opportunity for people to grow their own food anyway, even if they wanted to. This is a typical landscape of inner city Tokyo, is housing. Is there anything like the Greenbelt legislation we had in the UK? In the 1930s, we saw housing spread left, right, and centre out of London, and then it got stopped by the Greenbelt. The Japanese cities, it just carried on. They carried on sprawling. And as they sprawl, they leave behind areas of agricultural land embedded in the suburb. That then creates, in the landscape, the opportunity for places where people can grow their own vegetables if they choose to do so. And the desire to do so didn't really come back until the 1970s. The key driver in the 1970s on the demand side was the oil prices, which hit Japan really hard because they were over 90% dependent on Middle Eastern oil for energy supplies and therefore just about everything else. So there was a real consumer panic. And the possibility of growing one's own food then became an interesting possibility for worried consumers. The other thing was that during this post-war industrialization, as the labor supply was sucked into the cities, Farm labour force shrunk, farming was mechanised, and marginal areas of agricultural land became uneconomic. Little strips of land high up in the mountains, which previously had been farmed, <coughs> could no longer be farmed because there's no longer the labour supply to do it. But there was a, a geopolitical concern that if agricultural land was allowed to go out of agriculture, if Japan ever needed it again, it wouldn't be available. And this is particularly important with rice-based cultivation because you've got all that investment, investment in hydraulics. And so we start to see on both the supply side and the demand side an interest in making agricultural land available, particularly marginal agricultural land on the edge of cities. This beaten up sign um, on the edge of the field, uh, this is the 51st year of the Emperor Shoah, so here are those year uh, Japanese official documents always still show years of the imperial system, is an imperial system, outside the city of Kobe. And this was an early and at the time illegal experiment by the city of Kobe to encourage the conversion of land to agricultural uses for people commuting out for an hour or so out of, of Kobe to do some growing. This is what the landscape looked like a few years ago. This is agricultural land, formerly uh, paddy cultivation land. You can see that in this slide. Here are the allotment gardens in the foreground. And in the background we have the buns uh, with the stubble of rice um, showing uh, there is are um, soybeans growing as well as some rice drying on the left hand side. So the idea is to maintain the infrastructure for rice production, but put the land over to this temporary use. <coughs> And one of the mechanisms for that is, all oh, everybody wants it. They've got a lot of them, they want a hut, fine, but you put the hut over the irrigation ditch. So it doesn't interfere with the hydraulics. Genius, genius way of proceeding. Well, that's a local initiative. Nationally, um, the Ministry of Agriculture um, decided that it needed to respond. But it had a couple of concerns. It didn't really like the idea of people who were farmers farming. There was also a concern related to taxation. In Japan, when you die, you pay a hefty capital gains tax. And particularly farmers, if the value of their land is going up, very hefty capital gains tax. Unless you give an undertaking that the land will remain in agriculture. 
in which case you dodge the tax and it goes over generation. But sensing the possibility of fraud, the Japanese Ministry of Finance ruled that conversion of land to allotments constituted a non-agricultural use, so if you did it, you get a hefty tax bill, which meant that people who were leasing their land for allotments, when they got to their 70s, they came under heavy family pressure to cancel the lease and take the line back so they could prove when the farmer dies that they hadn't actually been conducting a fraud or indeed farmers. So how do you square the circle on this one? Well, the idea came about in 1975 to charge an entry fee. A farmer could farm, but the farmer could ask people to come in and help them grow. And if you do that, you can charge them a fee. And you can allocate them a task on the farm, uh, including harvesting, and you can let them take some of the food home. It's a you know, benign gesture. And so you end up with acts of genius. The, the gentleman here is a gentleman by the name of Cato who came up with this wonderful system, which is a, an allotment gardening school. Uh, this is the view across the allotments. Each of these white markers shows the edge of a particular person's plot. And as you can see, visually, everyone is doing exactly the same thing. They've all been told to do exactly the same thing. Here are your grow onions. Grow your onions here. So when the official from the Ministry of Agriculture goes past, it looks like an ordinary field. This is what a farmer would do. Looks like agriculture, must be agriculture. But actually, it's a form of allotment cultivation which is highly controlled under the myth that these people are students of agriculture and will go on and do something else. Through measures like this, we see an expansion, a very rapid expansion in the supply of sites for a lot of gardening. And that pressure on agricultural land of worrying about how are you going to keep it fit for purpose, fit for agriculture, led the Japanese government to start thinking about maybe introducing new laws relating to allotments. And whenever Japan thinks about, well, we've got to do something big, we've got to introduce new laws, they've always done the same thing. They look abroad for models of good practice. Here are some ideas we can incorporate into Japanese practice. And so they started to look overseas. And there are a couple of the gentlemen who um, undertook this here, a uh, co-writer of mine, um, Azuma Ren, and this gentleman here, Professor Norio Tsuge of uh, Tohoku University, he was sent with the European delegation to investigate British allotments. Where, whereas his, uh, his friend there was sent off to look at German ones. And what um, Tsuge said about British allotments didn't make very nice reading. Um, it was he who pointed to British allotments being the worst in Europe and having a continuing lingering image of allotments as a form of poor relief. Going back to that, those origins. And here you see a typical English allotment site. Am I right? It's in Uppsala, it's really um, stereotyped sometimes. We'll look at a more stereotypical Swedish allotment in a second. Whereas these were the best. This is a Bavarian Klein Garden. Um, this particular one, the shed here, has a, a cloisonne where enameled um, bust of fry, uh, fry state pie and coat of arms on one side and a bust of Mackie with the second on the right hand side. So this is a, a steeply Bavarian uh, institution. This is the sort of fine thing that Japanese should copy or tone down a little bit. Um, this is a Swedish example. So the Japanese introduced new legislation with a view to emulating this kind of European example. There were two acts. The first was an act which allowed agricultural land to be rented to non-farmers. And the second meant that you could put infrastructure on agricultural land, like car parks, pub houses, huts. So you've got the infrastructure and you've got the capacity to rent. Those two things came about as a result of that European study. And the supply of allotments uh, exploded in consequence. And we see different forms of allotments developing depending upon the context. 
in very high mountain areas where we have very tiny fields, OPC uneconomic, you see the development of sites which are specifically developed to attract people who are going to commute three or four hours to get there because of the distance. I'm going to stay overnight in the German tradition of staying overnight. So this is an example of a municipally funded allotment site uh, in Nagano Prefecture. That's three hours drive from Tokyo. The um, gentleman here is not the tenant, it's the tenant's father, but he's realized this is an awfully good retirement home, so that's what he's turned it into. And that's an aerial view. Um, why this particular piece of land was used, you can see the pylon, and the pylon is quite important to this because it makes it unattractive for other leisure uses. And the sort of people that we attract are people like this. This gentleman is using an allotment garden to grow white flowers as an English garden with the occasional pink one as well. And he is growing this with his gardener. This is the florist from the end of his street. He goes up to help him every weekend. Why white? Uh, he is the owner of the Japanese franchise for Wall's Ice Cream. This is a vanilla garden <laughs> uh, with hints of raspberry ripple flying uh, through it. <coughs> nice facilities. Um, this is the clubhouse for the gardeners. It has a grand piano, would you believe, for a lot of gardeners. Okay. <coughs> Um, this is another example nearby, this is former um, tobacco growing land, which also with the decline of Japanese production of, of tobacco was a problem. We see uh, very fine facilities like this in rural areas. But, most of the demand for allotments is actually in cities. People who are not prepared to travel that far and don't have the financial capacity to do that sort of thing. Um, so what about urban allotment gardens? Well, under the legislation, there were some showcase centers built around Japan of what allotments might look like. This is the one in the city of Sendai. Unfortunately, this one was completely inundated and destroyed by the tsunami. It's right next door to the um, coast of Sendai, which was full on. So uh, this disappeared in 2011. But it gives you some flavor of it. The allotments of this segment over here with their own car park down here in Clubhouse. This is in the local <coughs> municipal um, park, the horticulture centre. This is the allotment gardener's clubhouse in stainless steel and plate glass with signs in Japanese, English, and Braille inside to help you steer away for blind gardeners. And as you see, any it's all done there, that's what Japanese law requires. And hose pipes here so that people can put clean off their boots before they go into the clubhouse. Funny money paid for this. Um, we also find the development of allotments <coughs> linked into the local rural economy as a means of stimulation of local areas. This is another site in Kasama, which is north of Tokyo, and built in with the allotments, some which are residential, some which are games. <coughs> we find a restaurant, we find a library, we find a shop, and inside the shop we find locally grown vegetables. Not grown from the allotments, but by local farms. So people come from Tokyo, they do a bit of gardening, they go to the shop, they buy some local vegetables, money is cycled into the local economy. What that means, <coughs> what do they do here? They also take back charcoal for barbecues. A very traditional activity in Japanese rural areas. Charcoal making died out as a major concern after um, gas started being imported in the 1950s. And they reinvented the sort of a craft industry. However, there is a, a fundamental problem with Japanese allotments, allotment legislation, which is actually the same as a problem here that we don't talk about. It becomes very acute in the Japanese case. Under Japanese civil law, state funding cannot be used in a way which privileges or is confined to specific individuals. It must be accessible to all. The fruits of it must be accessible to all. 
allotment gardens in this country. I've been cultivating the same plot for 30, oh God, 35 years, but there's yet no sign that I'll be kicked off. And as long as I sort of behave myself, I'll just carry on. That is cultivating publicly owned land exclusively for my own benefit. That's a British tradition. It's not acceptable practice in the Japanese context if public money is involved. So how do you square the, that particular issue? The first thing you do is make sure the plots are small. The smaller the plot, the more people you can cram into the same space. A tactic which has been used extensively by British local authorities over the last few years, basically on waiting lists for allotments, they made allotments smaller. So at least everybody gets a go, but not necessarily a chance to grow a 1944 diet on a very large piece of land. So you can see each of those is slightly smaller than an average family car. And instead of this right to continue to garden as long as you behave yourself, allotments in the public sector are allocated by lottery. An annual lottery, if you're successful in the first year and there are surplus, there is surplus supply for the year after, then you may re-enter the lottery, and there's no guarantee. And in any event, your tenancy in law cannot last longer than six years, and then you're off. A very different concept, alien to this country, until the London Borough of Islington introduced a 10-year limit uh, about four years ago. So we see the beginning of the same process here. As you see, average tenancy lengths, one to two years, 60%. Not because people don't like doing it or give up, but because they're forced to go to make room for somebody else. And we also find high rents. Um, this little piece of ground that you can see here on the same I say, the, the Beyond the gentleman's head is where his plot ends. That's his lot. And the rents that you're paying for that is the equivalent of £250 per year, if this were a full-size English plot. And very, very expensive by our standards. Not by Japanese standards, I have to say. But very expensive by our standards. In the private sector, we have this problem with taxation. And there's a pressure because if people get to enjoy their lot with gardening, they do tend to carry on year after year, there is this risk of what do you do when you want the land back to avoid the tax man? And you've got sitting tenants and they don't want to go. Under those circumstances, you wouldn't want to put it under allotments in the first place. Local authorities in this country wouldn't choose to put land under allotments, most of them I suspect in the first place. Um, nobody would in a rational economic world. Um, this particular example is a, a way of getting around that. This is a community of gardeners, the Haggy Dialogue Association, uh, northeast of Tokyo. And what they do is have land rented from a local farmer. And most allotments in Japan are on private land. There isn't a great deal of public estate. And they build an infrastructure of clubhouse and huts and everything else, which you can actually pick up and move. Indeed, most typhoons do that for them, just blow the whole lot over and have to rebuild it, but it's built for that. The idea being that by being demonstrably mobile, cohesive as a human group, but demonstrably mobile, you're less threatening to landowner. And indeed, this particular group has moved successfully on a couple of occasions one piece of land to the other to another, no friction, keeping the coherence of the group of gardeners, but just moving in a peripatetic way to uh, another site. Um, very good on publicity. This is why they are carrying here. This is a <coughs> box of, um, uh, was it Dutchy Royal or something? It's um, Prince Charles's orange biscuits. Um, and they sent Prince Charles, uh, last night, they sent Prince Charles a Christmas card with his picture of that biscuit on it. There's no record of how it was received. There they are. And there they are. And at the same time as facing the gardener, they also have very close awareness of the importance of public support. So this is a public highway, and along the public highway, they have planted varieties of decorative plants which people choose to go out just to see. 
looks spectacular. Spectacularly nice. And you can see their temporary structure on the left. Uh, another example. Um, the point I wanted to conclude on today um, is about the future use of allotments in the Japanese context, but also in the UK, because I think we're missing a trick in this country. Because of the world's uh, highest levels of longevity, high um, uh, people living well in men and women living well into their 80s on average, have an issue of managing an older population. And one of the uses that's been developed for a lot, which is specifically, it's a matter of social policy to encourage the development and use of allotments as a means for keeping older people active. Uh, this is a typical book behind this, this movement. Um, it reads, Shilba no no Susume, a summary of silver gardens. Silver being a euphemism for getting a bit old. So you can see granddad and, uh, and, and daughter, presumably, with their children, uh, all enjoying this uh, lifestyle. Uh, this is an allotment garden in uh, Nerima Ward in Tokyo, which is specifically reserved to people over 60. You might think that's ghettoisation, but they fall naturally, cheerfully into groups, supportive groups, supportive within the garden, but also supportive outside of the garden. In this way, there's an example from Takayama, uh, way up in the Japanese Alps. Uh, I was driven around Takiya, I was there on a recruitment trip and uh, by the Ministry of Agriculture officials, local officials, and they took me to see their gardens and we drove past this. And I said, well, what's that? They said, we don't know what that is. I didn't do with us, sir. Right. So I said, well, let's stop the car, let's go find out. And this was the same local authority, but it's a welfare division. And the welfare division have been putting resources into developing a lot of specifically for older people. And, um, they guard one, and then they also socialise inside the press clippings about we're at the picnic together. <coughs> and this has now reached the point where it's developed into a commercial interest. This is, and it's the final slide I have for you, this is on the Tokyo subway, on the um, roof of the uh, those of you who've been to any Japanese city will recognise driving around in a, in a train of these advertisements hanging down from the roof. And this is saying you can have the allotment lifestyle, grow your own vegetables, and live this happy sunny life if you come and buy a property from us. It's building off the back of that uh, whole older lifestyle image of food sales policy <coughs> to drive the property market. So it's an interesting place to, to end on for you. So that's what I have to say. Well, I'm sorry. <laughs> Next, please. Question, yes, Jim. Yeah. Is it apparent that the um, living direction of the Japanese is significantly different to the living direction of you? You still have this concept. Yeah. Uh, it's very much age related. We, we, we kind of miss that. Yeah. Uh, we, we treat it in a derogatory way. Um, certainly thought we, in the 1960s when he looked at allotments, he characterised them as working class <coughs> um, and old, poor and old. Um, but actually, I mean, I, I've done a degree in social gerontology, I'm very interested in this. If you look at the leisure activities of older people, younger people, I get asked sometimes, why not get young people out onto allotments? It's good exercise. No, it's not. It's rubbish exercise for young people. If you're young and you're fit, go and do something energetic so you don't get to be decrepit <coughs> like me when you're older. Yeah? But if you are as old as me, the range of options for exercise become more restricted. If you're not into golf, this is one of the things you can do. And there's one other thing that's very important psychologically related to aging for this activity. When you get into the later stages of life, or into Eric Simon's School of Psychology, one of the things 
to do in order to progress is to put your life in order, to make sense of it. And that requires an opportunity for contemplation and for solitude. Not to be all antisocial and to go out the mountain, but also an opportunity, to, space to think about where you've been, possibly where you're going. But, and what was it all about? And the garden provides that. It provides a very good environment for doing that. It's therefore psychologically health promoting as well as physically health promoting. The Japanese are quite positive. So, is it the case that uh, most Japanese don't have their own garden in the sense that we have like a lawn and a patio? And, uh, uh, that's, that is the case. And the garden is there primarily to be viewed as aesthetically from inside the house. If you, and if you're in a car that is the cabinet in the house, the gardens are small and they're there as a, as a visual extension of the home. So you arrange them so they look nice when you open the window, yeah. but they're not productive at all. Never more could they be at that scale. Or you saw the side of it in a city. Cramming. You wouldn't sell all those in Japan very much more. No. <laughs> very, very thin garden walls, yes. <laughs> And indeed, uh, very thin gut. I was in a big earthquake in Japan in 1979, and the, the 78, the biggest killer was garden walls. Because they were thin, six foot high, but that thin. And then the old ladies walking past in the street to school. <laughs> 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 with stone, four stone there, with four or five large stones there, which people sat around and contemplated. I contemplated for hours, yeah. I, I had a... I had a pleasure of visiting a professor of um, ecology who taught at my university um, and was very well thought of on the basis of a book which he plagiarised um, into Japanese, as though we could then tell. The major Western source. I found this out because I was asked to back translate it for publication in the West, so I went to a major source and recognised what it was. It was he writing around for tea, and he had this garden exactly like stones, large from all over Japan, and he had a pond that was about yay by yay, and he had 12 large carp in it. And he said to me, You know, I love this garden, I love this garden, but the carp keep dying, I don't understand it. I thought, Yeah, they're in a space that by that by that, in a professor of ecology. Anyway, here. David, you have a pylon to contemplate in your garden, don't you? Okay. Yeah. We have a what? Pylon. A pylon? Pylon. Super great. Oh, right. It's not about the garden, you might think. Drive around. Drive around. It's a very large view. Anyway, thank you for your attention. Thank you. 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 Thank you, Mr. President. I'm absolutely staggered. As a very keen gardener, I knew about Japanese gardens, but I never knew they had a lot of this. <laughs> and we have heard that so much. Um, Cleve Wesley, the uh, well-known garden designer, boasts that he has a pizza oven in his allotment. And you've shown us restaurants and clubhouses. It really is a different world, isn't it? My, my father had a allotment right through the Second World War and I had one until I retired and after that I found I just hadn't got the time to maintain the allotment. But it's been a wonderful experience listening to you and learning so much. And uh, fellows, if you join me in applauding in the same way, you can watch.